warm welcome here to the Wine with Jimmy channel and thank you for clicking by. Welcome to the first in a very important in-depth series here on grape varieties called the Noble Nine. So I'm going to go through what that means, of course. Let's have a look on the Noble Nine. So this is according to the WSET Level 3 syllabus. So if you are studying, this is exceptionally important for your understanding of your studies for your examination. So the Noble Nine. Now, the Noble Nine are the most important nine grape varieties as per the WSET Level 3 syllabus. OK, they feature in the winemaking chapters eight and nine in great detail. They then feature throughout the book in terms of country of origin and region of origin. So it's very important to link these together. That's what these presentations will do. Now, because there's so much information on these noble nine varieties, there's a very high probability of the challenging short written questions. So this series is mightily important for your understanding, of course. Um, and I've split it into two series. I'm going to go through the all the theory, all the information in this series called the Noble Nine. And then series two will actually be short written qu questions on those Noble Nine grape varieties. So here is your series on the Noble Nine, nine grape varieties, nine parts. And we'll focus on Riesling to begin with. Now, this variety and this video is available as free content, as is part five on Cabernet Sauvignon. But all the other grape varieties, parts two to four and six to nine, are only available on my e-learning portal. You'll see the information for that at the bottom right hand of the corner of the screen. So winewithjimmy.com. Lots of exclusive video content, as you know, there and extra resources for your studies. Let's start talking about the absolutely important Riesling, one of the most noblest grape varieties in the world and possibly the queen of the white varieties. Now, first of all, we must classify it as a white noble variety, either as aromatic or non-aromatic. And Riesling certainly is an aromatic. So aromatic wines are those that have pronounced uh, aromas and flavors. They include the likes of Riesling, of course, Sauvignon Blanc, Gewürztraminer, Torrontes, and Muscat in the level three syllabus. The aim of the winemaker is to retain and enhance the primary fruit character, of course, of which there is a lot, an aromatic amount, and also make sure that it's protected in the final wine. Uh, the steps in the grape growing and winemaking process will be tailored to achieve this particular style. Let's get into Riesling even more. And we're going to first of all talk about what it's like in the vineyard, then the winery, then its key characteristics uh, and aromas, and then we'll go into where in the world we find this very regal grape variety. Now, Riesling is very capable of producing a variety of wine styles uh, from different parts of the wine world. It is very tolerant of cold winters and it buds late so that means it's very much suitable for cold climates. Cold climates certainly with continentality, which means that the winters can get quite bitter, but Riesling can withstand those very low temperatures. The late budding means that it in fact will avoid spring frost uh, or it has more of a possibility to. So that means it's more of a consistent grape variety. More vineyard considerations here. It is mid to late ripening, dependent on the style of wine that one wishes to produce. And in fact, left on the vine, it can accumulate sugar without losing its natural high acidity, which we all love about Riesling. It's therefore exceptionally perfect for making well-balanced wines at a range of sweetness levels, and no doubt you have tried a Riesling that is dry all the way through to luscious and sweet. Um, and talking of luscious and sweet, it's also widely used to make botryatized sweet wines. So that is wines that are made from botrytis affected fruit like you see in your picture. 
wine making options of this key grape variety. So we need to talk here very much in a general sense around aromatic grape wine making. So this will be quite similar and applicable to those other aromatics that we mentioned, Sauvignon Blanc, Torontes, Gewürztraminer, Muscat, for example. Now, aromatic grapes that will make, of course, eventually aromatic wine will need to be handled very carefully to retain their fruit, floral and primary character. Sulfur dioxide will commonly be used throughout the process of reception and processing to ensure that protection against oxygen. And crushed fruit or whole bunches may be loaded into the press. And I'm showing you here, actually, from my winery, whole bunches being pressed of Chardonnay there, actually. But for Riesling, this will happen. And either immediately or after a little skin contact, depending on the winemaker's approach, uh, approach, of course, the press will occur. The juice must be relatively clean uh, before fermentation to ensure that there is no solids there that could end up masking the fruit flavor. So often a gentle method of clarification, typically settling, will be done in order to separate any further solids from the juice. All of this, remember, is to obtain a clean, fresh juice without very much minimal uh, intervention or outside effect. The fermentation options then. So we were just talking about pre-fermentation. Now we're talking about fermentation, so during fermentation. Stainless steel is often the, the vat or your vessel of choice allowing uh, easy temperature control. Cold fermentations give a slow, steady fermentation, as well as encouraging the formation of those primary fruit aromas in the wine. The choice of yeast will depend on the winemaker, uh, so that can't be necessarily determined at this presentation. Further fermentation options, large old oak vessels called foudre, in the in France, in Germany, Fude. Uh, these are sometimes used for Riesling, um, moreover in Alsace than in Germany. And this allows a small amount of oxygen ingress. So a little bit of oxygen affects the wine. This can enhance the texture and add a little complexity to the flavors without adding, of course, unwanted oaky characteristics. Now, aromatic grape varieties generally see very little post-fermentation processing. The high acidity is the most desirable feature of Riesling. So malolactic uh, conversion, MLC, is avoided by either um, bringing the wine down to a very cold temperature uh, or adding sulfur dioxide or, to be honest, a bit of both. And the reason why we avoid malolactic is because it does convert some of the acidity and it changes it from being quite sharp to soft, which is in fact not what you want for Riesling. Um, now, also, you can get buttery, uh, mallow based characteristics in your wine, which is avoided at all costs. Now, Riesling may go under a little bit of lees contact with some batonnage that adds texture and flavors, and that's what you're seeing in this picture on the left-hand side. Aromatic grape varieties will generally be bottled as soon as possible after fermentation, and the aromas gained from maturation in new oak are, are usually not desirable. Uh, but remember, in some parts of the world, there might be some aging, like in Alsace and a few parts of Germany. And of course, there is sweet wine making here too. Riesling's very famous for this. Riesling can be made into a whole range of sweet styles. Premium quality sweet Riesling will generally be made by prematurely stopping the fermentation, either by chilling, and that makes the yeast very lethargic and, and then that will be filtered out, or by killing the yeast by adding sulfur dioxide. Uh, and once it stops, that leaves behind the desired residual sugar, which hasn't been 
converted to alcohol. For the sweetest Rieslings, they will be made from botryatized grapes, like you see on the left. And because there's so much sugar, the yeast cannot fully ferment, so it will eventually die off, and that leaves residual sugar. See, these are naturally sweet examples. Your aromas and flavors. So in cooler climates, like let's say the Mosul, it produces wines with green fruit and often floral notes with a touch of citrus. In warmer climates, let's say Eden or Clare in Australia, it becomes richer in flavor with more predominant stone fruit, but it tends to lose a bit of delicacy. When Riesling gains its maturity, it develops flavors of honey and toast, and they can also gain oiliness and petrol, which is a compound uh, of quite a lot of complexity, which we won't go through right now. Okay, so where in the world do we find our Riesling grape variety? Of course, we must begin at the spiritual home of Riesling, which is Deutschland, Germany. So we are looking at the area of the Mosul on this map. I have uh, sort of dumbed down in green everywhere else, but you can see here in orange uh, with the large old Roman city of Trier is highlighted here close to the Eiffel Mountains. Um, so this river goes from the Alps, Luxembourg, and it meanders its way and meets the Rhine. It empties into the Rhine. Um, it has two rivers that run into it, which are fairly famous in the upper part of the Mosul. That is the Saar, S-A-A-R, and the Ruwe, R-U-W-E-R. Now, in the Mosul, the white grapes are all important here, and Riesling is by far the most important white grape variety. And key production is centered around the region or the area known as the Middle Mosul or the Middle Mosul. There are a number of villages here which have established a very positive reputation for producing high quality single vineyard wines attached to their village. And this is on these classic steep slopes, which are very slate in geology. The slate offers really good heat retention and it creates a little bit more ripeness in your grapes. And the slope means that any rain that does fall here gets great drainage, plus you have great direction or aspect in this way. The Rieslings here, though, in the Mosul, because it's one of the coldest parts, tend to be typically lighter in body, lower in alcohol, and higher in acidity compared to the wines of the other key zones like the Rheingau, Nacha, Rheinhessen, or Pfalz. You'll find, along with that green, lemon, floral character, um, you'll find more of that, really, that comes through. And, of course, if it does have residual sugar, you'll find often a little bit of grapiness to this. Now here I'm showing you a typical sweet chart for Mosul. They tend to be in the kind of medium sweet category. That's why we've got four highlighted here. Very high acidity, but generally quite light in body. Now the sugar might add a little bit more body, but it still tends to be quite light and fairly low in alcohol. Famous producer on the right is J.J. Prum making their Veilenen Zonnenhör. So that's from the town of Veilen. Zonnenhör is your single vineyard site. And it, this is categorized in Pradeketswein as a cabinet. So this will be about a medium suite in style. So we were here in Mosul. Uh, so if we follow that river to the Rhine, and of course it empties into the Rhine, and then we start going against the tide, I suppose, of the Rhine, we come around the bend here, the Bingen Bend, and we come to this purpley area around Wiesbaden, which is the Rheingau district. This is a small but very prestigious region. Most vineyards are situated on south-facing slopes on the north bank of the River Rhine. This combined with the protection of the hills or the mountains, the Taunus, which sits just above it, means that we actually get quite robust 
dry wines made here. They tend to be medium to full body, hence why we've got four out of five highlighted here. Still the typical high acidity, moderate alcohol in this instance without sugar. But please be warned that the humid conditions here mean that sometimes Riesling is made into sweet wines at the Auschleser, Birken Auschleser and Trocken Birken Auschleser levels. But the bottle here of the famous Schloss Johannesburg shows you a Riesling Trocken from uh, Silberbach uh, Grand Cru Vineyard. Beautiful wine. Then in between is the wine producing region of Nacha. So this is in between both the Mosul, the Rheinhessen and the Rheingau. Uh, and the best vineyards are actually situated on the north bank again of the river Nacha, facing a variety of south. The best wines are made from Riesling, it is the most wisely planted grape variety here. And geographically, it sits between Mosul and the Rheingau. And also stylistically, it sits between both of those. So it's actually wonderful between those two areas. Now, um, the typically you have that acidity, which is very classic of the uh, whole of the Riesling grape variety. But you'll find slightly riper fruit. And typically, a little bit of peach comes through and slightly more orchard or red apple in terms of its, uh, its uh, apple-y characteristics. So there you go, high acidity, medium body don't go for there, and moderate alcohol for a dry example of a Nacha wine. The other areas, uh, so you have this large area, in fact, the largest area in Germany, which is in red here, called the Rheinhessen, Rheinhessen. Uh, and this also produces a significant amount of Riesling, the famous part being on the eastern side, uh, right on the Rhine, because the Rhine actually is on the north and the eastern border of the Rheinhessen, around the city of Nierstein on some steep cliffs called the Rhine Terrasse. Uh, and these are east facing, making some rather nice, robust Rieslings. Following that down, you come to a region called Falz. And in the middle part of this, around towns such as Forst and Deidesheim, you'd find an area called the Middle Heart or the Middle Heart. And that's because the mountain range which flanks its western side is called the Heart Mountains, which in fact is a continuation of the Vosges Mountains from the south, from Alsace and France. Very lovely Rieslings here. Again, quite ripe and very comparable to the Rhine Terrasse Rieslings. So they're quite big in style. The Fouts along with Baden are the driest and warmest parts of Germany. Franken is more famous for Silvana but does make some interesting Rieslings typically dry and then Baden is more famous for the Burgunders, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc but there are also some Rieslings found in this area. Crossing the border, so I mentioned uh, just a moment ago that up here is Faltz and the Middle Heart, and the continuation down here is France and the region of Alsace. So Riesling in Alsace is the most widely planted of the noble grape varieties. The best here are towards full-bodied, with medium alcohol, high acidity, with citrus and stone, and typically a very sort of minerally, wet stone, steely characteristic. Sometimes there are wines with some residual sugar, certainly from the Grand Cru sites, but there's been a movement of late for all types of Rieslings to be drier. Now, as a point of comparison to Germany, these wines do not typically show so much floral compounds like the German Rieslings do. Austria is next. It's less widely planted than, say, Gruner Veltliner. Only a couple of percent of Austria is Riesling, and they tend to come from the districts all nestled here in the western part of Lower Austria. And that's Wachau, Kamtau, and Kremstau. They're usually dry, nothing listed here on the sweet category, high in acidity, towards full-bodied, with moderate alcohols. The best examples can certainly age very well from Austria. From Austria to Australia, we go next. And um, I should have really sort of quoted from Dumb and Dumber, shouldn't I? 
Um, please, if you can remember the quote, pop it in the comments section below. I think it's uh, good day, mate. So Clare Valley. Now, Riesling, uh, this area, by the way, is South Australia around the city of Adelaide. And Riesling is a speciality of Clare Valley, which I've highlighted here on your map in red. This lies to the northwest of Barossa Valley. The warm climate here is tempered by cool afternoon breezes and the nights are actually quite cold. Many vineyards are planted at three to 400 meters with the highest being near 600 meters. The Rieslings are dry with intense citrus and limey characters with a very high acidity. And they age really, really well, developing honeyed and toasty characteristics. Eden Valley, this is located in the hills to the east of Barossa Valley, and it has a cold to moderate climate that varies with altitude. Um, outstanding quality Rieslings are also made here in the cooler areas, having intense lime to grapefruit characteristics and a stony, steely character. The best have a real great propensity to age with marmalade and toasty characters, typically at about 10 years old. Please do look out also from Rieslings in the Franklin River part of Western Australia in the Great Southern and also Tasmania. And then the rest of the world. These are only really short mentions in your textbook for the level three syllabus. In the United States of America, on each of the seaboards, we have some Riesling production. In Washington state, there is a real significant amount of Riesling and one of the world's largest producers, which is Chateau Saint Michel. Uh, so Washington state in the Pacific Northwest. They tend to be on the drier side. And then in New York state, specifically around the Finger Lakes in upstate New York state, we find lovely, um, lovely, delicate, mineral focused and very high acidity Rieslings, typically dry, but there are some off dry and medium dry examples as well. There's a little bit found right in the southern extremities of Chile, which is the Bio Bio Valley, it tends to be dry and aromatic. And then, of course, across Riesling, across New Zealand, Riesling is quite interesting, but still quite small in total production. Okay, well, that brings me to a conclusion of the first video of the Noble Nine. Please do join me for part two, looking at Sauvignon Blanc. If you wish to view this, but you are not a member, you'll need to go across to www.winewithjimmy.com to sign up for a subscription to get that special access to these videos. If you do have any comments or questions about this series, about Riesling, please do get in touch. Perhaps you have some comments that you would love to share about your experiences with Riesling around the world. Remember, what I've taught you is not exhaustive. There certainly are places elsewhere um, that produce Riesling in small amounts worth seeking out. Uh, you can also get in touch with social media at the bottom of every slide. And if you do find yourself in the UK, come and say hello for a class, glass or bottle. I've been Jimmy Smith. Ciao for now. Goodbye.